Good evening. Welcome to the AO North America online series. This is the Advanced Risk Summit. We're going to talk about scaphoid fractures today. My name is Amit Gupta, and I'm at the University of uh, Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. So um, at the end of the session, we'll, uh, we'll be able to discuss the approaches to diagnose a suspected scaphoid fracture identify the characteristics of the scaphoid fracture that lead to a bad outcome, outline the algorithms for treating acute scaphoid fractures, and describe the available surgical tools for treating acute scaphoid fractures. Uh, all your microphones have been muted and your videos have been turned off. You can uh, go to the Q&A box for questions. Don't use the chat box, just chat box for communication only. So I have a great faculty with me today. Um, with me is uh, John Elfer from uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, there is uh, Nick Poulos from uh, Mayo Clinic and John Capo from New Jersey. So we'll have a, we'll have a great time um, with this. Um, let's go ahead and do that. So all these, um, uh, you know, conflict of interests uh, have been resolved by the EO North America Committee. Um, and here they are. So this is how we'll uh, divide it. I'll give you introduction, start with the case, and then what about diagnosis? Then we'll talk about what characteristics of the scaphoid fracture point to a bad outcome, then the algorithm for treating acute scaphoid fractures, then the available surgical tools for treating scaphoid fractures, and case discussions, and then summary. So let's uh, start uh, start with Nick Barton. And Nick Barton is a uh, was a hand surgeon. He's uh, he's in Nottingham, uh, in England, and he said in 1989 that we may think that we know all we need to know about fractures of the scaphoid. The reverse is true. Most of what we've been taught and what uh, we therefore believe we know is unproven, and much of it is actually untrue. Many questions about diagnosis and management remain unanswered. I think we can. Uh, we have made a lot of progress in this count, uh, and we continue to making progress here. So he wrote a, a very good article in 1992 called 20 Questions About Scaphoid Fractures. We will be only able to answer four questions uh, of, about the scaphoid fractures with evidence today, and we'll try to tell a clinical story to outline uh, the answers to those questions in this presentation. For the rest, you'll have to look uh, you have to go find our book, which will be published probably next year. So it's it's not every day that uh, in hand surgery and orthopedics, we begin with an article from The Lancet. And it's a uh, particularly great pleasure for me because my friend and co-resident when I was training, Joe Dias, uh, was the lead author of this uh, study. Um, There's a called a SWIFT study, Surgery versus Cast Immobilization for Adults with bicortical fractures of the scaphoid waist. Uh, and th in this study, which was published in the Lancet, it's a great study. Uh, there were 439 patients. It's a pragmatic, uh, prospective, multi-center, randomized trial uh, of 439 patients, 205 in cast, uh, 220 in cast, and 219 in three-level surgery. And they did PRW assessment at 52 weeks, um, and they found that surgery had a little bit more complications, but there was no difference in the union rates. And reoperations complications were more in the surgery group. They also did a CT scan at 52 weeks, which is unusual, and they found screw penetration in the ones that had undergone surgery. Again, the other thing was there's no difference to return to work uh, in either of the groups. So no significant difference between cast and surgery uh, in terms of results. Uh, in non-displaced scaphoid fractures. And their conclusion was that 73 scaphoids need to be surgically treated to avoid one non-union. 95% confidence interval is 24 to 100. So adult patients with scaphoid waist fractures displaced by two millimeter or less should have initial cast immobilization and any suspected non-union should be confirmed and immediately fixed with surgery. This treatment strategy will help to avoid the risk of surgery and mostly limit the use of surgery to fixing fractures that fail to unite. Now, this has been coming along from uh, Nottingham uh, and Leicester and Derby and all these places in, in, uh, in the middle of England. 
there have been good articles coming out. And this was an article from Tim Davis's unit uh, showing uh, that CT scan at four weeks will, uh, will uh, suggest whether scaphoid is healing or not. And again, another article from Tim Davis's unit, and it shows that you can get uh, perhaps 50% uh, union and you can at 50% union, you can have the patient start using their wrists. Um, and that, that uh, suffices at about four to six weeks of immobilization. There were some nice articles from uh, Canada also, and this is uh, from Ruby Graywall and Nina Su in 2013. And they showed displacement or instability like this, or fracture gapping, or uh, comminuted fractures like this and CT scan need to be treated early uh, and they're unstable. Uh, sclerosis didn't make that much of a difference, neither did uh, bone absorption or cystic dieback. So they looked at humpback, and that had seven times the incidence of uh, non-union translation, had three, three and a half times incidence of uh, progressing to non-union combination at two and a half times the incidence of progressing to non-union. So this is the uh, our index patient. This is a 16-year-old person. He fell onto the outstretched hand while playing soccer presents to the emergency department with pain and swelling in the right wrist. There is swelling over the snuff box and intense tenderness over the dorsum of the wrist and over the scaphoid tubercles. These are the uh, x-rays in the ER. I just want you to look at this and remember this case. So these are the x-rays in the ER in this uh, young person. Uh, and there's an oblique view also and see if you can see anything anyway. So uh, the patient was splinted uh, and asked to make an appointment with the hand surgery office. Well, for some reason, he didn't make an immediate appointment. He came to the office three weeks after his injury. Uh, he complained of pain and swelling in the snuff box, tenderness of the escape for tubercle and snuff box and decreased range of motion of the wrist. So here is this patient, same patient at three weeks, uh, as you can see, um, these are the uh, situations. So I'm going to ask, uh, um, say, John Elfer, if you uh, come on. And so, John, what do you think at this point? Well, these are it's an AP and a lateral X-ray of the wrist, and, and this is uh, showing uh, a scaphoid fracture that uh, is the sort of first time, first glimpse, and the initial radiographs, like so many of these, uh, looked normal. Um, and it's uh, sort of in the distal aspect of the waist is my guess, um, uh, but it's displaced uh, and so therefore unstable. Okay, very good. Thanks, John. So I'll then leave it to John to uh, take the next uh, uh, lecture, which is John is gonna talk about uh, uh, scaphoid fracture diagnosis. Uh, I'll stop sharing now and John, go ahead. Okay. I hope that this works. So can you see my screen? Can you, uh, okay, well, tell me if, if you can't. Um, no, you're good. Okay, um, uh, so uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I have a short uh, talk on uh, um, scaphoid fracture diagnosis. That's the, sorry. That's, the, that's what we're supposed to talk about. And this is for this little short part. These are the three questions we really wanna get at. Uh, when to suspect a fracture, what to look for and how to prove it. Um, and these are sort of basic things, but uh, uh, it's amazing how much controversy exists surrounding them. Just some basic facts about the scaphoid. This is the scaphoid. This is the most common carpal uh, fracture. It happens in young men often. Uh, there's a 90% union rate. We're going to go over that or others are going to go over that. The common mechanism is the fall on the outstretched hand um, uh, with hyperextension. Um, why bother to worry about the scaphoid fracture? And the reason is you're trying to prevent the consequences of scaphoid non-union advanced collapse. Uh, there's a natural instability that happens when this relatively large bone in the wrist uh, starts to shuck around in a way that is not stable. And uh, this is the reason to try to treat these. And the natural history of these is, is, is poor without uh, treatment. The most important thing I'm gonna to say to you today is uh, a diagnosed scaphoid fracture just does a lot better than a missed one. Um, and so how are you gonna diagnose it? The physical exam, uh, 
scaphoid series x-rays. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to talk a, a, a lot about the special studies, uh, what they're for and what they're good for. What we're not going to talk about is uh, bone scans because they're not done very often anymore, although they are, are diagnostic within 72 two hours of the injury. Uh, any, any discussion of this topic brings up the Duckworth criteria. I don't know Andrew Duckworth. If any of you do, uh, uh, get me his uh, uh, contact information or just shake his hand. He wrote these great articles um, on uh, predicting uh, fracture after suspected injury to the scaphoid. He's a trauma surgeon in the United Kingdom. Um, and out of 260 consecutive patients, 223 returned for evaluation. They had 62 patients uh, that uh, they confirmed as a scaphoid fracture in. And what was important, these four factors, and they were independent predictors, snuff box, box tenderness and ulnar deviation within three days or at three days. Uh, a scaphoid tubercle, uh, volarly that was tender at two weeks, the patient being male, and it being a sports injury. And these together, all four of these together were 91% uh, um, uh, predictive of uh, the fracture. He went on to publish another paper uh, on the assessment of suspected scaphoid fractures. Um, uh, uh, and he came up with, the, the group came up with two really interesting points. The prevalence of scaphoid fracture in patients who are suspected is pretty low. Um, and this lowers pretest probability when you study these. That, th those are my words, pretest probability. But it makes it harder to do statistics on this uh, injury. And there's no reference standard for a fracture, which makes it hard to compare. But all told, the re result of this was if you had to get one advanced study to prove it, the MRI was best, even though there was a possibility of false positives because the MRIs uh, tend to light up a little bit uh, with any bruising in, the, uh, in that bone. Sorry. Um, okay, uh, there, there was this, this uh, SMART trial. And the SMART trial, the goal was a randomized perspective, parallel, non-blinded, one-center trial to evaluate the use of MRI in the acute setting in patients presenting with a suspected scaphoid fracture. And the important thing about this trial, which was very interesting, is they were looking, they wanted to know the real-world impact uh, clinically and economically of an immediate MRI. Uh, to rule out scaphoid fracture. This is their rationale paper. This is the, them setting out why they're going to do this. Uh, but they went on to uh, uh, publish this paper more recently. Um, and the big conclusion here, oh, I'm sorry. The big conclusion here was that there was a cost savings. But you, you have to take this with a grain of salt because their cost saving confidence, confidence interval spanned parity. So it spanned no savings at negative 30 uh, pounds uh, to uh, significant savings at uh, around 378 pounds. And the p-value for that, that result was 0.09. But MRIs were really good, uh, be, uh, specifically at picking up other injuries and scaphoid fracture incidence was pretty low, six to 10%, depending on the, on the group uh, in their uh, study. So this leaves us with an imaging uh, set of imaging guidelines that say something like this. You want radiographs. You want a PA, a lateral. Some people believe you, you want 45 degree obliques. Most people believe you want that anterior posterior view to stand the scaphoid up, an ulnar deviation or scaphoid view. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, Thirty percent of these films are not diagnostic and initial evaluation, so you probably want these as well two weeks later. Um, and uh, there is this great uh, CT literature, and it's a it 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 is a uh, um, uh, common to talk about CT uh, scanning in the axis of the scaphoid. Uh, but I don't actually think that that's a thing, and I'm going to tell you why in a second. So CT scans are really good, but long axis of the scaphoid, I'm going to tell you what, what, uh, what we know about that. And then, of course, there's this MRI. I've shown you two, two really good sets of studies on how MRIs are really good at identifying the occult fractures. And, of course, bone scans are rare. This paper caught my interest, diagnosis of the occult scaphoid fracture. And what they found in this paper was for empiric casting to be more effective than advanced imaging. Again, these people are looking at it with the perspective that uh, you're trying to figure out whether you should get an advanced study to know whether the scaphoid is, uh, fracture is there or wait the two weeks um, that all of us were taught to do. Um, and uh, 
the cost of the MRI has to go up by $2,000 for it to not be worth it in that study. Or MRIs and CT scans have to get pretty bad, 25 and 32% um, uh, at, uh, at uh, picking up these scaphoid fractures. The sensitivity has to decrease. So these are good studies to get. Here's a case I stole from Dr. Stern. In fact, many of these slides are stolen from Dr. Stern. Um, PA lateral and a scaphoid view, just so that you get a, a feeling for them. Um, you're supposed to know to repeat the x-rays. Here's an example of an April film. And then in June, it starts to show, look at these little cysts forming. And then of course, hell in a hand basket by October. It's falling over, it's really clear. And you wish you would have known about it back in April. Um, uh, the power of CT. So CT scan is a really great study. There's no doubt about it. Um, uh, 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 it, it. It is very good to get these in patients who have snuff box tenderness. This is a case from uh, Greg Summercamp, a friend of mine. And here is an example of uh, a set of films that are probably pretty equivocal. Maybe some people can pick up a fracture in this, sorry. Uh, but here's the uh, Dr. Summercamp's uh, uh, results. Uh, showing a lateral interscaphoid angle of about 35 degrees and uh, an AP1 of about 42 degrees. Um, and so uh, this is a really good diagnostic and it helps for surgical planning and it's high resolution. Let's talk about the long axis of the scaphoid CT. I had a partner uh, some years ago who was uh, uh, very into this. And when I was in fellowship, my fellowship uh, attendings were into this. I never really uh, um, uh, got the but when I went into practice, my partner was uh, asking for these uh, for his scaphoids. So I went down to radiology. It's all based on this uh, case, uh, uh, case report by uh, Dr. Sanders. Um, and the idea is to try to get the CT scan with the rotation of the, uh, of the CT gantry in the plane of the scaphoid. Um, but it turns out that when you go down, I went and spoke to a radiologist and I asked him, how do you do this? And the guy said, we don't, we don't do this. Uh, ever. Uh, what we do is we just get our CT scans. They're high enough resolution. We just reformat the pictures to make them look that way. Um, uh, so I didn't believe him, but you know, when you dig into, into the literature, they have uh, computed tomography for suspected scaphoid fractures. The comparison of the reformats in the plane of the wrist versus the long axis of scaphoid. And this paper and others like it are written with the idea that they're just gonna get the regular CT. It's whether or not they should reformat them to look at them at all. Um, and uh, they don't have to. Uh, so I think that it's just something to keep in mind. CT scan, very good. Long axis of the scaphoid uh, is probably just something we're used to looking at um, as surgeons. Uh, here's a case example from a long time ago, an 18 year old uh, lacrosse player, hyperextension injury. Here, you look at these x-rays and you'd have a hard time finding a scaphoid fracture in these x-rays. This is in uh, May. Uh, uh, and the question is what you would do, and most of us uh, would probably cast, immobilize, and re-examine. Um, uh, um, few of us would get a bone scan, and half of us, or maybe a quarter of us, would get CT scans, and uh, a bunch of us would get MRIs. Um, what's important is that, that this patient happened to get an MRI the very next day, and uh, the MRI showed a scaphoid fracture. Uh, you can see it right here. This is a T1-weighted image. Um, and this patient continues to play lacrosse in a, in a protective cast. And here we are at the end of the month, it's, it's there. Um, and so uh, 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 about a month later, a screw is placed, pro perfectly appropriate anti-grade screw in the scaphoid for a proximal uh, fracture, and it goes on to heal uneventfully. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, acute scaphoid fracture, my preferences, this is sort of a summary slide. We're only gonna go through the first half of the slide, but I took this slide from Dr. Stern. Uh, I usually thumb spike of these patients uh, straight out of the emergency room for a week or, or, uh, or 14 days. I repeat the physical exam and the x-rays and um, I get an MRI if there's, uh, if there's no evidence of fracture and the patient has pain. I don't get an MRI and I go uh, uh, I consider surgery if there's evidence of fracture and displacement. I'm going to skip these next parts because I don't want to talk about treatment. I think the take home messages are simple here uh, and everybody knows them. And I think most of us agree with them. So this is kind of an easier uh, talk. You suspect the scaphoid fracture with snuff box tenderness, even if the radiographs are negative, even after two weeks. That's probably the most important thing anybody can say about uh, scaphoid fractures. Uh, you probably can't go wrong with a non-contrast MRI, even if it's early, or a CT scan. Uh, you may discover other injuries on the MRI. I think the literature supports that. 
While many fractures are ultimately fixed, the important win for the patient, I think, is discovering the actual fracture because an immobilized scaphoid fracture is likely to heal. Alas, not always. Uh, and many thanks to Dr. Stern, uh, Dr. Paul Hutchinson, one of his fellows, and the rest of the Mary Stern Fellowship, and of course, my hero, John Capo, uh, and all of you for your patience, and thank you. Thanks, John. Um, Marco, do we have any questions at all for John? Uh, no, I mean, everything's good. I, okay. John, I mean, I could ask a, a quick question to John. And John, uh, if you had to you know, if you had a CT scan as a real quick option versus an MRI and the CT scan came back negative, but they still had snuffbox pain um, a week or two later, would you then consider an MRI or would you sort of wait and see? I, I personally believe the CT scan sensitivity is as good or better. Okay. Um, uh, so I think a high resolution, good CT scan that shows no fracture and good cortis cortices on both that medial and lateral border. I actually don't get an MRI to figure out whether the scaphoid was bruised. It probably was. However, I like a CT scan a few weeks later, and I think Dr. Gupta mentioned that, uh, to confirm uh, that it's some, whatever it is that's going on is healing, especially if I get that six, four, six, five, four, five, six week mark and they're still tender. Uh, so I don't send them for an extra MRI if they have a CT scan. Thanks, Johnny. <laughs> Okay, um, so John. Can I ask a question, Ahmed? Yeah. Ahmed? Yeah. yeah. Um, to John, um, you, you uh, gave it a lot of good reasons to follow your guidelines, but there are several studies that have looked at uh, getting, once you, if you see a, a, what looks like a, a fracture early on, to get a CT scan right away because. That will tell you if it's displaced or not. You can't always tell the alignment on routine x-rays. I, I absolutely agree. And I'm going to talk about it in this part and in the next part. So uh, your often, question will be answered in detail. I, I often do that too, Dr. Jupiter. I, you know, I think it's a good idea. OK. So I will start sharing my screen now. So thanks, John. Um, now, you heard that most of these fractures will heal uh, with, um, with non-operative treatment and you can cast them as is shown by the SWIFT study. The question is, can we identify the characteristics of a fracture that point to a bad outcome? Pick those things out, pick the bad actors and see if we can uh, treat those uh, more aggressively. So, what are we preventing? We are preventing non-union and we're preventing uh, snack wrists. So I think we should uh, uh, try to pick up the bad, bad characteristics. We know that interruption of blood supply is a bad thing. And starting from Oblitz and Holstein's 1938 paper in which they basically took dried scaphoids and counted these uh, 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 vascular uh, perforations and found that there are a whole bunch of these in the waist of the scaphoid. There's a whole bunch of this in the distal pole, but very few in the proximal pole. And uh, the uh, beautiful studies of Gelberman, Menon, Telesnik, and Kelly showed that the waist has good blood supply, the distal pole has good blood supply, but the proximal pole doesn't. And the recent study is of uh, <clears throat> Steve Moran showing that, uh, you know, you have 3D uh, CT scans uh, with these injected specimens and the vascularities in the uh, waste and in the distal pole, not so much in the proximal pole. We know all this. So there are other preventable causes of scaphoid non-union, which are failure to recognize the fracture. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. Inadequate initial treatment. And I think Nicholas and uh, Nick will talk a little bit about uh, these two factors. An improper assessment of bone healing. So in all series, you'll find that there's always failure to diagnose. In Radford series from Cambridge, 54% of the non-unions did not have adequate initial treatment. And in our published studies, 65% patients did not have adequate initial treatment. And in Von Schroeder study in 2011, more than 50% did not have adequate initial treatment. Now, is it, does it matter? Damn it. Can, I inter can I interrupt one second? It looks like your yeah. slides are not advancing. I, I don't think you I was gonna um... say, if you could go into show mode, try to start your slideshow. It looks like you might be on about slide five of this, yeah. Okay, I'll share again. Perfect. 
Uh, okay, can you see that now? Nope, we're, we're looking at all your files. So if you'll click on that one more time. Share screen. I can see your desktop, Mac. So what are you seeing right now? I can see your desktop as I go on the share screen. Um, I'm thinking it's For your- For some reason. Yeah. I see your this, uh, your screen. So you're not seeing any, you're not seeing any of your files? No, I'm, I, as I share, I see your screen. Okay, I'm not sure why. You might have to log off and log back on. Should okay, let, let me do that. Should we go to the next presentation? Um, he's gone. Yep. He should be right back. Otherwise, we might need to get ready to go to the next presentation and then come back to him when he's back. Yeah, I can share my screen until he gets back. Is that all right? Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Mac. He's back. Dr. Gupta, we, um, we were just going to move to the next presentation. Would you like to try yours again? You're actually muted right now. All right, go ahead. Okay, great. So let's just move along and then we can go back to him. Thank yeah. you. Great. So uh, my name is Nick Polis um, <clears throat> from the Mayo uh, Clinic. What an honor to speak with all these great presenters uh, today. It's zero degrees, I think, was the high today in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, but eventually this will this will melt and the uh, elderly distal radius fractures will go down and we'll start seeing the young scaphoid fractures again. Uh, here is uh, one of my patients, a 23-year-old who fell on St. Patrick's Day uh, and suffered this scaphoid fracture. And so I think it's informative to know where the diagnosis gets missed. Uh, as we heard earlier from Dr. Elfar, I agree. I think diagnosis is probably nine-tenths of the law, so to speak. So this study looked at 88 cases of scaphoid non-union in 85 patients and tried to assess what were the causes of these uh, delayed treatments. 31 of the patients sought no medical advice for their initial injury, and 13 uh, were seen at greater than four weeks post-injury, which Dr. Gupta will talk about the significance of that later. So a little more than half were patient factors. They just didn't present with the injury to medical care in time. But 15 of these patients uh, were actually seen by healthcare providers. Eight did not have uh, radiographs, or seven had radiographs ordered, but were interpreted as normal and mismanaged. So you know, a sixth of these are related to physician factors. And I think depending on where you are, and certainly in my uh, old military practice, this is a big thing, which is recognizing the injury, no question. We talked a little bit about this at the last um, talk. And I think for me, once I've recognized the injury, I think the CT scan for me gives a lot of information because as an orthopedic surgeon, it tells me about the architecture of the bone uh, and helps me to plan if we need to do surgery and also allows me to explain to the patient uh, whether or not surgery would be advisable for them. With CT scans, we have that ability to sort of predict, predict <clears throat> uh, whether these will go on to union and also how long it may take us uh, for these fractures to unite. There's a nice study out of Ontario where they performed a linear regression and found that for scaphoid waist fractures that were minimally displaced, really they could heal in as little as 48 days uh, with that time being nearly doubled for those proximal pole fractures. And of course, as uh, Dr. Gupta had mentioned earlier, those humpback uh, and uh, translated fractures have a high risk of non-union. And so those are the ones on CT scan that you need to be wary of and have a good conversation with your patient about. You actually have to go back pretty far in the literature to find uh, studies that assess the outcomes of displaced fractures of the scaphoid treated non-surgically. These have very high rates of non-union, uh, which we all know now. But even for minimally displaced scaphoid fractures, whether you treat them in a short arm cast with a thumb immobilized or not, 
greater than 10% of these can go on uh, to non-union. And so for surgeons, uh, it's no surprise that <clears throat> we're looking for alternative treatments for these scaphoid fractures. Uh, as from my partner, Dr. Shin, when he was out taking care of sailors and Marines in San Diego and randomized 25 active duty service members to percutaneous screw fixation of scaphoid waist fractures versus cast mobilization. And what they found was that percutaneous screw fixation led it to a quicker time to union and an earlier return to work uh, compared to cast mobilization with really no difference in secondary outcomes and functional outcomes. This has been repeated several times. Uh, here's another study, 60 patients. Again, earlier time to union with percutaneous screw fixation compared to cast immobilization. You can see how long these are immobilized, 13.9 weeks. So it's really no surprise uh, that as surgeons, we've looked for other ways to treat these to see if we really need to immobilize these fractures as long as three or four months. Uh, this was a nice study out of the UK, which looked at 59 scaphoid waist fractures with a very specific treatment algorithm. They were immobilized in a short arm cast without the thumb immobilized and performed a CT scan at four weeks. And in half of those, there was evidence of healing at four weeks. And those patients were moved to a protocol with gentle range of motion, but no weight bearing. The other half uh, did not show evidence of healing and either went on to four more weeks of immobilization or surgery if they had displaced or translated. And what they found was that 25 of the 26 patients actually united their fracture with just four weeks of mobilization in a short arm cast with the thumb uh, free. And so that leads us really to the SWIFT trial, uh, which Dr. Gupta alluded to at the beginning of uh, our talk this evening. A really large study, 400 patients ended up being randomized for, uh, and were assessed. 203 uh, had surgery in the first one to three weeks. The other half uh, had cast immobilization for an average of 45 days. And the primary outcome that the authors were uh, seeking was the PRWA, patient reported risk outcome evaluation at 52 weeks. And with regards to that primary outcome, there was no difference at 52 weeks between surgery and cast immobilization. The surgery group uh, did have higher functional scores at 12 weeks compared to the cast immobilization group. But again, at 52 weeks, there was no difference. Not surprisingly, when looking at secondary outcomes, there were higher rates of surgical complications in the surgical group. And so how do we put this all together for the patients that we treat? Again, here's our patient with the scaphoid fracture who fell on St. Patrick's Day with uh, a little humpback and displacement. Well, I use this algorithm here, I think to help us think about this. So right off the bat, if the fracture is displaced or humpback, we know that's at a high risk uh, for non-union if it's treated non-surgically. And so those patients are indicated for surgery after a discussion. And again, I think a CT scan that really helps to show the patient what we're looking at. If they're minimally displaced without humpback, then I think it's reasonable to pursue cast immobilization, whether you wanna do it with a short arm cast with or without the thumb immobilized. And then you can assess that with CT healing along the way. Uh, and if they heal, then you can begin motion and if not, and there's any displacement, then you can move on to surgery. And I think that's important that you discuss with the patient that just because we're gonna try and treat this with cast mobilization uh, doesn't mean that they might not uh, require surgery in the future. I also think for some patients, there's reasons to jump off the algorithm. So if the patient might be a high-performing athlete or needs an early return to work, then it might be reasonable for these to be treated uh, with uh, screw fixation because of the earlier return to work uh, results that we've seen. Ultimately, like many things in medicine, especially uh, in surgery, this is really a shared decision-making process, which is to explain to the patient the risks and benefits of surgery. Some are sort of easier under indications than others, but if you're gonna pursue non-surgical treatment, I think telling the patient ahead of time that they may require surgery in the future uh, is worthwhile to save some time uh, in the future. And so I think for this patient, it's a little bit easier of a choice uh, for me. Uh, this patient had uh, screw um, screw fixation uh, and went on to heal uh, uneventfully. So now I think uh, we were gonna go to Dr. Capo or Dr. Gupta, are you? Are we gonna go back to, to your talk? Uh, I'll, I'll take sure. that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, can we, uh, we did get a question from one of the attendees. And I, yeah, this is, I, I have a question, Marco. Oh, go ahead, Jesse. Um, it refers to uh, what 
Nicholas was talking about and the study out of uh, Darby, talking about at four weeks with evidence of healing. Is the amount of healing uh, quantitative? In other words, you can see healing, but not complete healing. And sometimes if you let that patient go and become active, then you'll see them at a year later with a non-union. So do you quantitate the amount of healing? Does it have to be more than two thirds of the way across the bone to be considered yeah, in, healed enough? Yeah, in, in their study, it was 50% uh, uh, healing. Yeah. They, they considered it was adequate healing. Yeah, I think that's very important because I think sometimes before we did, did not, get, when we did not get CT scans and it looked on x-ray that fine, it's healed. Uh, those patients showed up late uh, with a non-union. Yes. That's a good point, Jesse. Um, uh, you know, um, there was a question from one of the uh, attendees as well about, and this is a perpetual question we always ask in terms of uh, long arm immobilization, short arm immobilization, thumb included, thumb not included. Maybe we could just go across the panelists and attendees and ask, how do you how do you treat them conservatively? What do you like to do, Nick? So I think we benefit uh, in our practice because these are often seen in the emergency department initially and our residents probably over immobilize with a long arm thumb spica with the thumb included. Uh, and so but when I see them back in clinic, I think if it's a minimally displaced or non-displaced fracture, then I'm comfortable with a short arm cast. The patients like it uh, significantly easier. Uh, I do still include the thumb with the IP free, uh, though I recognize that goes against what I just spent the past 10 minutes talking about. Thanks. Anybody disagree or yeah. do it differently? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the uh, studies that uh, people referred to was uh, one paper by Harris Gelman, and there was some mostly um, anecdotal studies which uh, talked about the long arm cast, and that became the standard of care in the United States. Uh, but in the rest of the world, people use thumb spiker cast forever. And uh, there was a paper from Joe Dice's unit from uh, Nigel Clay was the reference. And they just did a, a, a Collies type of a cast, leaving the thumb free. And if you put a Collies cast and a thumb spiker cast in your, your own hand, you'll feel the difference. There's a huge difference in the comfort level. And patients are able to actually uh, work if you just put a Collies cast. So, uh, you know, uh, prospective studies have shown that there's no real difference between the Collis cast and the thumb spiker cast, and I use a Collis cast. We got a comment from Tom, um, Dr. Fisher, from saying the thumb included is a practical concern as you. We lost your sound, Dr. Rizzo. We lost your audio. Is that better? Yep. Yeah. Now you're back. So the gist of it, maybe we could ask Tom to chime in. Uh, you know, so Tom, you're an advocate for including the thumb because you want to protect the patient from themselves. Is that, am I reading that correctly? Yeah, Marco, I, I think it's a practical problem when you put enough material in their palm, they can't grab large objects with that hand. I, I'm more worried about them lifting and firing their FCR and flexing the scaphoid in, in semi- stable situations and uh and if i don't trust them i i even put them in an above elbow cast because it's really hard to lift carry grab or twist with a long arm cast on it depends on my level of trust to the patient and i said i trust teenagers about as far as i can <laughs> thanks tom always wise always some wisdom from dr fisher um i don't know i mean i don't want to eat into time because i know we yeah. lost some time but uh, yeah. I'll go ahead and let you. Uh, go yeah, ahead. let's go ahead and talk about. Uh, now you heard, uh, you know, the, the Swift study, and that most of these fractures will heal uh, if they're put on a cast. But there are certain fractures which have bad correct characteristics, and the question is, can we pick those up? Can we pick up the bad actors? And uh, we are tr basically trying to prevent non-union and snag the progression of the scaphoid, uh, bad scaphoid fracture. In order to uh, pick those up, what we need to uh, identify. So uh, we know that interruption of blood supply uh, is a factor in causing scaphoid non-union. And the studies from 
Oblitz and Holtz in 1938, in which they took dried scaphoids and counted the foramina, they found that uh, the foramina in the um, waist and in the distal pole, and the very few in the proximal pole, and then the classic studies of Gelbum and Menon, Telesnik and Kelly showed that there was a lot of vascularity in the waist, but and also in the distal pole, but very few in, uh, in the proximal pole. And subsequently, the recent studies uh, by Steve Moran showing the injected specimens and uh, uh, 3D CT, micro CTs, showing that uh, the distal pole and the uh, waist and very few uh, vessels in the proximal pole. So we know that. Now, there are other things, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, we mentioned this, uh, Nick mentioned this, and um, uh, Dr. Jupiter mentioned this also, failing to recognize the fracture, inadequate initial treatment, and improper assessment of bone healing uh, are causes of preventable, uh, preventable cause of scaphoid non-union. Failure to diagnose. In many series, you'll find that uh, 50 and over 50% uh, of their series, uh, they didn't seek adequate initial treatment. In Radford studies from Cambridge, in our study, 65% did not have adequate initial treatment. And Von Schroeder studies that uh, Nick uh, uh, mentioned, uh, over 50% did not have adequate initial treatment. So does it matter? Well, Langloff and Adlison showed that delay in diagnosis of less than four weeks, the union rates are the same as fresh fractures. And if the delay in diagnosis is more than four weeks for treating them non-operatively, then there is a higher rate of union. So the other thing is improper assessment of bone healing. And, uh, and Jesse Jupiter mentioned this. So you, um, you uh, see this fracture, you think it's healed, you, you take the immobilization off, patient goes away, comes back a year later with, non, with the fracture not healed. And this is more important if you're doing assessment of healing by x-rays. And Joe Dias has shown this in this classic study in 88, when he took 20 good quality x-rays at 12 weeks post-injury, and he sent it to eight of his good friends, four orthopedic surgeons, four radiologists. And two months later, he shuffled them up and sent send the same x-rays to the same observers. And what he found was there was poor intra and inter-observer correlation of bone union. Not only did they not agree with uh, one another, they did not agree with themselves two months prior. So the conclusion was that radiographs at 12 weeks do not provide reliable and reproducible evidence of healing. You need to do a CT scan and, and see if this thing is healed or not. So, but what are the characteristics of the scaphoid, the fracture itself? Well, uh, there are a few. One is a displaced fracture and a comminuted fracture. And this has been known since 1981 from Leslie and Dickinson's classic study. Unstable fractures, fractures which have different patterns of uh, fracture which can separate out. Fractures with copal instability and deformity and proximal pole fractures. So these are the four characteristics which we'll talk about. And obviously if you uh, turn them around, then these are the indications of primary ORIF or CRIF. Displaced and comminuted fractures, unstable fractures, fractures with couple instability and deformity and proximal pole fractures. What about displaced fractures? Well, it's been known and many studies, especially uh, Edlin's study in 1975, that 19% non-union rate, when the fracture was displaced more than one millimeters, the non-union rate was 92%. And then the recent studies of uh, Joe Dias, it's a meta-analysis and also uh, Gray Wall and Nina Su uh, studies uh, showed 22% non-union displaced uh, and comminuted fractures. So this is quite uh, apparent. The displacement of this fracture is quite apparent. But then there are fractures which have subtle displacements uh, in different planes, and you can pick them up on, on x-rays. But sometimes you need CT scans. Now, if you want to call it an undisplaced fracture, you should make your criteria very strict. Lack of any displacement. Scaphal unit angle has to be less than 60 degrees. The interscaphoid angle has to be less than 30 degrees, coronal interscaphoid angle less than 40 degrees, and absence of any communition. So these, these uh, on CT scan, this would be probably considered uh, non-displaced um, fractures. There was a study from, um, uh, from Europe, and also David Ring was there, that showed the displacement and plain X-ray diagnosis sensitivity was not that good. It much, improved much better with CT scans and also the accuracy of diagnosis is much better with uh, CT scans. 
Well, uh, Joe Dyson uh, did a uh, uh, meta-analysis of all the literature and they found that odds of non-union are 17% when displaced fracture treated in a cast compared to surgery. And they looked at uh, historical uh, series of fractures treated in a cast, historical series of fractures uh, treated by surgery. And they looked at uh, different series. Uh, they, they said displaced fracture have four times higher rate risk of non-union uh, odds ratio uh, with uh, confidence interval 2.3 to 8.7. So, and then there was a study from uh, Ruby and Nina uh, from uh, Canada and they looked at displacement. They looked at uh, uh, all these uh, displacement in different planes. They also mentioned comminuted fractures and comminuted fractures are definitely displaced fractures. And if you have comminuted fractures, those are bad actors. So humpback deformity, I, I talked about it, seven times uh, rate of non-union. Uh, translation is 3.4 times rate of non-union and combination is 2.5 times rate of non-union. The next step is what about unstable fractures? What are unstable fractures? Well, McLaughlin 54 and Herbert and Fisher in 84, they talked about this vertical oblique type of fracture, which displaces because uh, when you have a transverse fracture, it can compress. And when you have a vertical oblique type of fracture, uh, the fracture ends can displace. It's a simplistic view of uh, this uh, of instability. Um, when you have situations like this, a vertical oblique type of fracture associated with combination, this could be a bad actor. So in early internal fixation would result in better prospect for the patient. When you have displacement or instability like this, when you see the instability through a um, mid-couple portal, then you can fix this, uh, reduce them and fix them adequately and you get a better result. This is quite apparent, the instability in this uh, is very apparent here and you have to uh, reduce this. This is a fracture which has got a vertical oblique type of a, a pattern and uh, with a CT that confirms it. Uh, so this type of, so instability uh, can be defined uh, uh, in these terms, in terms of uh, the angles. Um, so um, again, uh, Boozy and uh, Ring showed that instability can be better diagnosed uh, with a CT scan rather than with a um, X-ray, but even then, if you get more information, if you do a um, if you do a uh, mid carpal arthroscopy, then you find that even the ones that are shown to be non-displaced or un, uh, stable on CT, about a third of them are shown to be unstable on uh, arthroscopy. So here's a patient which uh, uh, is displaced a little bit. Uh, fairly uh, stable looking uh, CT and plain X-ray. But if you look at the, uh, uh, if you do a scope, so you, this is the scope first um, through the uh, radiocarpal portal, radiocarpal view uh, shows some of the comminuted segments, comminuted fra fragments that we saw earlier in the uh, X-ray and CT, some loose bony fragments. Uh, and these would be definitely uh, uh, unstable type of fracture. Then you see a mid carpal view and you'll see that this is scaphalunate area. And then you go uh, uh, go further into the, um, there's a separation of scaphalunate, widened scaphalunate interval. And you go further uh, looking at the fracture and you'll see that there is uh, definitely, you put in the probe and you can see the fracture fragments are widely separated and displaced. So this is obviously as you get more information with an arthroscopy, that shows that it's it's uh, displaced. What about the third segment, fractures with carpal instability and deformity? Fisk, in 1970, in his Hunterian lecture, drew our attention to this, that these fractures are bad and you have to uh, reconstruct them so that the geometry is reconstructed. And Fernandez uh, uh, talked about bone grafting, so it became known as the Fisk-Fernandez method or associated with carpal instability. So if you have situations like this, these are very bad actors and they have to be fixed primarily because they're in two different towns. So here's our uh, patient that we saw earlier with the uh, 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 CT scan showing that there is a humpback deformity and there is a DZ deformity there. The fourth characteristics that we can pick out are proximal pole fracture. 
Again, these are bad actors. Um, Rettig and Raskin showed that uh, they, they don't do well with uh, cast fixation, that you have to fix them uh, primarily. Uh, and there have been other publications showing that 34% uh, progress to non-union when treated non-operatively. So uh, uh, primary fixation of these uh, fractures is very important and it's been shown over and over again in the literature that uh, that is the case. And again, Joe Dias uh, and Eastley's paper, 7.5% risk of non-union uh, with uh, fractures managed non-operatively. So this is a case when there is a little avascular, uh, this vascular proximal pole, I would not call it an avascular necrosis, a disvascular proximal pole. And even these can revascularize once they're fixed uh, stably and reduced resulting in very good uh, outcome. So uh, pro-prognostic indicators are displaced fractures and comminuted fractures, unstable fractures, fractures with couple instability and deformity and proximal pole fractures. So indications of primary management are displaced and comminuted fractures, unstable fractures, and fractures with carpal instability and deformity, and proximal pole fractures. So the take-home message, same, repeat after me, displaced fractures, comminuted fractures, unstable fractures, fractures with carpal instability and deformity, and proximal pole fractures. Additionally, there are improper early management and improper assessment of bone healing. All right, thank you. Thanks, Amit. That's wonderful. Um, you know, it's a good topic of discussion, these proximal pole fractures, and Dr. Jupiter was uh, chatting in the chat box about this as well, and Jesse, happy to have you chime in. But I guess one of the thoughts is you mentioned proximal pole fractures and suggest it's their, is it instability or is it vascularity that makes them vulnerable to not healing? Well, um, I think it really should talk about vascularity um, with the very nice studies that were shown because vascularity isn't the real issue with scaphoid fractures or healing. Fractures won't heal as Ahmet just showed if they're not aligned and there's too much motion. So what happens with a proximal pole fracture is when you normally fracture the waist, you're hitting the ground with your wrist extended about 70 degrees. But if you get more soft tissue trauma, the scaphoid rides up and hits the dorsal rim of the radius in a more vertical position, which causes a proximal pole fracture. So by definition, there'll be more instability. And then if you take it a step further, if you fix the scaphoid like Ahmed showed, they almost all heal. So it isn't a question of vascularity. It's a question of too much motion or the fracture fragments not connecting. And that's why we, we continuously hear vascularity as a cause of the problem, but it's not. And it's really instability or failure to realign the fracture. And the proximal pole experience shows that very clearly. While the studies and these injection things do suggest less vascularity on these studies, if you fix the scape, if you realign it and fix it and stop the instability, they will almost all heal. Absolutely. You know, Peter Carter uh, had this thing. He, he, he did a, a, a scaphoid allograft, took a proximal pole. So if a dead uh, proximal pole from Miami can heal, I think your own proximal pole uh, mm -hmm. fracture can heal very well if you stably fix it. So I think uh, absolutely, it's not vascularity, it is stability. That is the critical thing. And stability is a critical thing in all skateboard practice. Yeah. Good points. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> okay, so I'll start sharing again. So, all right. So our story continues. So we uh, remember that patient, 16-year-old patient who fell and injured uh, playing soccer. Uh, and we saw the radiographs on the immediate... Uh, uh, period and then subsequently three weeks later we had this uh, uh, scaphoid uh, humpback deformity and a DZ deformity uh, and this is the situation here uh, and the question is what do we do now uh, and for that uh, we'll have John Capo tell us how to uh, fix the scaphoid in different situations. <laughs> 
Uh, John, I'll stop sharing now. And you could see in the midst, the last x-ray, that case is getting bad because it's flexed down on the lateral view, right? And the and the scaphalunar interval is increasing. Are you good? Yeah. Can, you, can you hear me? Yep. Yep, we're good. Here's your, yeah. my, my conflicts. They've been all um, sorted out. <clears throat> all right, so the learning objectives. So I'm just going to talk about some fixation techniques. And you've heard a lot of the, you know, these are bad actors. And I always say, <clears throat> you know, why is the scaphoid so, why is it such a big deal for us? Because it likes to break and then somehow it doesn't hurt on some people. And five years later, they come, come in. And it's a big problem because it links the proximal and distal carpal rows together, right? And then it causes all kinds of problems. So it's really, you know, that's why there's textbooks on the scaphoid. So it, it's, again, a critical bone that links proximal and distal rows. We can miss them. And the non-unions are a big problem, and we're not going to talk about how to fix those. But you, you want to catch the acute fractures and not miss them. So most of them are waist fractures. And I think, you know, just as an aside, you know, even with the closed treatment of these fractures, you got to look at at what the scaphoid fracture is. If it's a waist and a little distal, you could probably do a short arm thumb spike or maybe even, I still put the thumb in, but maybe even something less. But as they come even a little more proximal, it's a different animal, right? So even proximal third is more problematic. You might be, need to be more aggressive. So acute fracture treatment. I still put, I put them in a, a short arm thumb spike and I do a Munster just so they can't rotate. And again, this is the Gelman study. And there's a lot of studies that show kind of, you know, they do okay, but you got to look at the power on them. So this is an old study and there's significant difference and they did a long arm thumb spike. So I do a Munster, which comes up around the condyles and they can't rotate. And as, as Tom said, I look at the patient in the eye and assess their, we call it the knucklehead factor, you know, in New Jersey, how, you know, how problematic are they? But I usually immobilize the thumb. All right. So now we're going to fix them. So percutaneous is, um, is, le is the, the most minimally invasive. So I think you need to be able to go either dorsal or volar. And you know, you can't say, well, I'm, I just do them all volar because it depends on the fracture pattern. So Joe Slade taught us really the dorsal approach, but you need to hyperflex the wrist. You gotta watch the tendons and you really can't do a true percutaneous, I don't think, um, but it's easier to get center center in the proximal pole. Volar approach, Alex Shen and Margaret McQueen, it's easier, but it's harder to get to those proximal poles. So this is the paper that Nick mentioned. And basically Alex showed when he was in the Naval Academy, that if you do a perk screw for non-displaced and you do it well, they heal quicker and they get back to service quicker. And they actually had to stop the study because they were doing so well. But if you do a perk screw poorly and the screw's out of the joint, that's a big problem. So it's got to be done well. All right. So different approaches. These are pictures from a book. And <clears throat> Joe taught us, you know, to put it all the way through from volar to dorsal and come across. And you got to watch that wire and flex it down. I try to do them a uh, volar if, if it's amenable. So uh, dorsal and volar approaches. So the dorsal approach, and if you're trying to get center center in the proximal pole, it makes sense that you go dorsal because the proximal pole is right there. Um, so the dorsal approach in this study looked at uh, PERC. Uh, it's more parallel to the long axis of the skateboard and more perpendicular to the fracture line. So uh, they um, showed that the dorsal approach healed well, but again, you got to watch the tendons. This study looks at if you do it perk, you're going to hit the tendons a significant amount of time. So I make a small incision and look at it. So this is a, a fracture that's, you know, a waist. And like I was saying, this is a waist and a little distal, right? So this probably is going to heal. There's a little, there's a little comminuted piece here. Can you see my arrow? Yeah, we can see it. John. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Margo. Yeah, this little, little butterfly fragment is, is worrisome, but you could go dorsal or volar. But I think, um, for me, this is a young active guy that um, wanted to get back to surfing sooner. And um, I just lay him flat. I just lay him flat, tip it back, and then I do a perch uh, wire. And then wherever that winds up, and it's usually at the base of the thenar cone, and extend the wrist a little bit and get that wire. The whole case is the wire, right? Get that wire center, center in the proximal pole. And I'm pretty good here. I could get even farther down but with the, this fracture. It should be okay. And the trapezium is the problem, right? To get center, center in the proximal pole along the axis, you got to get through the trapezium. Because they think if you come dorsal, you're going to go right through the trapezium. And sometimes we have to drill. I mean, the axis, if you go dorsal, is into the edge of the trapezium. So 
watch that trapezium and always, you know, I probably nine for me, 90% of the time I have to drill that edge out, which is fine. We used to do that open and bring that down and get your screw centered in uh, along the scaphoid axis and a small incision. This is one of the, the great operations. I think if, if done well and Joe, again, uh, the late great Joe Slade used to talk about putting the biggest screw in the scaphoid. I, I try to put the smallest in because I want it to be stable enough, but to keep the bone there. And if I have to do a revision, I can put a bigger screw in. So again, you know, you want to put the screw center center in the proximal pole. And oftentimes you're oblique distally, and this is an old screw with a head. And even if you have to do that, you can, you can bury it down, but center center in the proximal pole. So this is a case of mine. Now we're, we're going to advance to, you know, displaced fracture. So a 37 year old male came to my office, nice guy, but he says he drinks five to seven beers a day. And I uh, fell down the stairs and he goes to work every day, closed injury. This is kind of a typical Jersey guy that we see, but you know, nice guy's there with his wife and it's broken. So he's got a displaced uh, scaphoid fracture and a distal radius fracture. And this is the truth that uh, here's a comminution and he's got a bad distal radius and the scaphoid, he's got the humpback here, right? So this is a problem, but it's acute. So maybe we can reduce it. And as he's walking out the door, he says, by the way, my right wrist hurts, doc. So, you know, it's the end of the day on a Friday. I said, well, get an x-ray. We'll check it. And luckily we checked it because his left one's broken too. And he's displaced, not too bad, but he's displaced. And you see on the lateral, his scaphoids flex down a little bit. So I think if it's, if they're good, if it's good bone and big fragments, you can try to do it percutaneous to reduce it. And, and David Ring, I believe has a paper on this saying, you know, it's possible. So I try to only deviate to stand it up and that distal and then extend it even a little bit more and your distal pole stands up and again, get your wire across the edge of the trapezium and you can extend it to get into the scaphoid and then even radially deviate to compress it. And you can see it's possible then if I flex the wrist down, uh, it'll bring that proximal pole up. Uh, and sometimes extend it so there's a gap. And I think it's a reasonable alignment, maybe a little bit short, but I believe it's acceptable. So if you, you know, be honest with yourself, if you can do it percutaneous uh, open, that's acceptable. If something doesn't look right with the wire, open it up because pr it's probably off. Um, so this is the radius on the other side and it's nice. You can put the tourniquet up on for the radius for the plating and then do a perk scaphoid on this side. And you know, I, I want to make sure this ulnar side of the scaphoid is perfect. He's got a little combination here. This looks a little off, but I think I got him reduced reasonably well. So percutaneous for displaced fractures is possible, but be cognizant of uh, your reduction. So this really displaced acute fractures. I may show some serious, you know, some really significant and, and uh, severe fractures. So what's displacement? A little bit of displacement in the scaphoid is no good. One millimeters. Uh, displacement. And usually it's hard to tell. And, and if there's any doubt, we get the CT scan to tell or 10 degrees of angulation with the humpback. So if it's off, especially in a young patient, you want to get it to, to be reduced and, uh, and fix it stably. So display. So what's the indications for opening it? Displaced acute fractures with a significant displacement that you can't reduce with joysticks. Uh, oh, very proximal pole fractures, even that aren't displaced. I think those are, have a, a, a high chance of, of delayed healing and non-union, and then the complex corporal injuries that we saw a little bit of. So how do we get there? So open approach volarly. We know the blood supply is a, prob is a problem. The dorsal ridge vessels are there. If you're going dorsal, don't strip those off. Volarly, is, there's, there's the um, carpal branch, the tuberosity branch that's, that's there. Don't strip that off, but you can get to the volar scaphoid easy, more easily um, for a humpback deformity and also uh, to avoid the vascular supply. So just some 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 uh, cartoon drawings, volar approach. So so scaphoid waist or distal, we go volar if you want to reduce it. If it's proximal third, you want to go dorsal because you really can't see the proximal pole uh, from the volar side. So I go through the FCR sheath, take the uh, FCR ulnarly, then go through the sh the sheath, and then you have the radioscaphal capitate ligament across here. So I'll tag that and take it out of the way if I have to open it and reduce it. Um, and, uh, and then repair the radioscaphal capitate ligament and you can get a good look at that scaphoid. Find the tuberosity. And again, even open, we're usually uh, 
you know, nipping out the edge of the trapezium or drilling through it um, and then reducing it from the bowler side. So this is a simple fracture, a little, a little comminution, an older case and a little cystic change. And I opened him and uh, put the screw in from the bowler side. So again, this axis is reasonably good, but you, you might even want to get a little bit more vertical. If, if you let the trapezium push out, you either go out the back or it pushes you out the front. So again, get, get your axis lined up. Unstable fractures, non-unions. So other fixation options. So my, my charge was to talk about how, you know, ways to fix the scaphoid. So you know, we were taught a headless screw down the center of the scaphoid is the way to do it. So it's the way to do it most of the time, but sometimes you know, there's comminuted fractures and there's you know, different, different fragments. You might need to use alternate techniques. So this is an older case of mine. Uh, a 38 year old young person with a scaphoid non-union that's fairly collapsed. And I got a CT scan, which I don't have the cuts here, but we've seen that distal pole kind of kind of mushroom down on the top. And uh, his, the rest of his corpus was lined up reasonably well. And you could say, well, you could excise that, but I fixed him with the bone graft and you don't want to just put one screw in here. So this is an older case. And I put wires in. I used to leave wires buried all the time, you know, if needed. And even you can put your wire across the volar aspect, distal pole, the scaphoid, proximal pole, and then outside the graft just to hold it in so it doesn't extrude. And he healed. I took the wires out at about six weeks. And he healed. He shortened a little bit, but he's got his scaphoid. And I, I think that's a good result. So <clears throat> I, I wanted to include plating of the scaphoid. I don't, you know, I've done maybe one or two. And this is a this is actually a picture from a biomechanical study that I did looking at plating the scaphoid. Uh, there's a couple companies that have the plates uh, and there's a case um, from, the, from the bank. So I think for a, a highly comminuted fracture where you wanna maybe put a cancellous graft in, uh, it's a, a viable option. Uh, we were surprised when we looked at the biomechanics that it's not as strong as we thought. It's a little stronger, but it's not, you know, it's not, not vastly stronger than the other construct. So something to think about, you know, a volar approach, locking screws, and sometimes you need this uh, plate. All right, so dorsal approach, you need to be able to go dorsal, right? It's just like distal radius, you know, we volar everything pretty much, but if you got to go dorsal, you need to know how to go dorsal. So dorsal approach, escape foot, proximal pole fractures, you got to get there. Unable to reach the volar from the volar approach, and if you want to graft it dorsally, and if you want to see, if you have a very proximal pole and you want to see that center center on that proximal pole, you know, go look at it and put your screws in because you got one shot to get that to heal and complex carpal injuries that we talked about. So here's a couple of drawings and cartoons looking at. So the scaphoid is really along the EPL sheath between, uh, between the second compartment and the fourth compartment. So you're in the third. And you really want to see that proximal pole and flex the wrist down and put your screw right down the, the proximal pole. And the axis of the scaphoid from the dorsal side is along the thumb, right? If you're looking at the thumb, you wanna put your screw along the thumb axis, but you wanna look right at it. And the good thing is if you have a proximal pole like this, your screw doesn't have to be very long. It doesn't have to get on the distal pole very far. You just have to get across this proximal pole. This is a difficult case. And this is, you know, there's a huge lever arm on this. So sometimes I'll even put a screw in and then a, a derotation pin from the scaphoid in the capitate just to stabilize it. And I have an old slide that, that Joe Slate put a screw across the scapegoat into the capitate, but I think a pin is fine. So here's a case of mine, a proximal pole, young guy, 27 year old, and you got one shot to fix this, right? And I don't wanna try to catch this from the uh, retrograde from the volar side, very hard to catch. So open approach dorsally and look at this proximal pole and you really have to flex the wrist down because you wanna go right down the axis. So hyperflexion of the wrist, don't bend your pin. If you turn around and your resident extends the wrist, you'll bend the pin. That can be a problem. And you don't have to, Joe used to talk about drilling it all the way through and measuring it. I think if you just get across and flex the wrist, you can see your length. This doesn't project well, but you wanna see that proximal pole. You can do a smaller incision than this. Um, and this is the screw. And I think it's a you know pretty good result. He healed and you're looking right at this. I know this is under the cartilage. And, this is the axis right along the axis of the scaphoid. And you see, if I went from the volar side, I'd be going right through the trapezium. So uh, this is a smaller screw. This is a 2.4 screw in that small piece. And I think um, he did well and he healed, but it's gotta be a real vertical axis of that screw. So alternate screw configurations, you know, not just one screw. So this is a proximal pole, a 21 year old with, the, with six weeks out with some cystic changes. So I, I wanna go 
dorsal on this and look at this thing because it's a very small fragment cystic changes and he's even got a little beaking of his styloid already flex them down i look at this thing and this will allow you to even graft it if you need to if the shell is intact and mark and i wrote a paper on this um if the shell is intact and you're putting a screw in and there's cystic changes we found that if you just ream it through the hole and even put graft through your drill hole for the screw, it'll heal. But if the if the cartilage is open here, I'll put some graft in here. But early cystic nonunions can be done percutaneous or uh, through uh, a small open approach, but without cracking the cartilage. But this is looking at that proximal pole, getting your screws in. And this was so small, I said, well, you know, I didn't think I could put one screw to hold it. So sometimes, you know, you have to do something different. So multiple screws. These are 1.5 screws I put across uh, with a little bone graft and he healed. So um, this is another case. So a uh, distal pole, just to show you, you know, you put the screws wherever you need it, both bone forearm fracture, a little styloid fracture as well, uh, compartment syndrome. And I put these 1.5 screws from the other side. Now they're not cannulated. And again, there's other companies that might have cannulated, but put your depth gauge in and two of the one five screws from the other side. And again, you know, watch your trapezium and he heal. I thought that distal pole, and sometimes I thought the distal pole was too small. Sometimes it's actually split longitudinally and you need two screws. Uh, unstable non-union, cystic changes, humpback deformity. And I opened them volarly and this is now what I do. Instead of the derotation pin, I'll put a derotation screw in. So, and you can decide whether you put your your derotation uh, um, screw in first or your center screw. But I like this one five with the two four, and then I don't have to worry about the K wires. So, bone graft from the radius, derotation screw, and again, vertical axis, uh, reasonable alignment. The AP looks a little off, but reasonable alignment and he did well. So complex carpal dislocation. So Amit touched on this, so the bad ones, and we need to reduce these openly. And so when I look at these perilunates, I open them dorsal to fix everything. And even if it's a waist fracture, I'll fix the scaphoid from the dorsal side. And then I always open them volar, and this, that's the perilunate argument, but I always, 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 always open them volar and release the carpal tunnel and fix the space of poyer. And if the lunate's there, I'll push it back up. And then the LT ligament is even torn there. So here's a, here's a standard, an older case, transcaphoid perilunate. And if this was just a waist fracture, you could go volar or perk, reduce him. And it's nice to kind of see that this, this is a proximal third. So it's not, a, it's not a simple fracture, but it's nice to see how it's reduced, but there's still DC here. So you need to fix these because they won't, there's, they're unstable and this will get worse. I've seen this uh, with sick patients that if you have to watch them, they continue to displace. So dorsal approach, open approach, reduce the scaphoid, put your wire along the axis of the thumb. Here's my wire, there's the screw going in. And I find that if you fix the scaphoid first, you can build off the scaphoid in the carpus and then pin uh, the mid carpal joint, the LT uh, ligament. And I bury the pins under the skin, uh, a little AVN of the lunate, but um, he did reasonably well. And I, and I hold them for about 10 weeks with, for the ligaments. Here's another case just to show, you know, what other tools do we have? So this is a transcaphoid perilunate, a complex injury. It's actually one of my partners uh, about two weeks ago. And compartment syndrome, the attending on call was smart enough to put the lunate in and pin it and span it. And the scaphoid is really, really comminuted. So really an excellent job of multiple uh, headless screws. And this is a, a 2-0 a 2-4 or a 2-5, a 2-5 and a 2-0 to stand up this comminuted fracture. And I think it's an excellent result. You see your, your, these divergent screws really stabilize the scaphoid and hold it up. So, you know, some, you know sometimes not just one screw, sometimes uh, multiple screws in a pin, sometimes a plate. So whatever it takes to make the scaphoid and the carpus look like a carpus. So in conclusion, Scaphoid bone, the scaphoid bone is critical. Like, don't miss these fractures. And we've seen subtle x-rays that, that, you know, that go on to non-unions or fractures. Follow them carefully, you know, and get at repeat x-rays. And if there's any doubt, you get a CT, you know, so we can um, address these acute fractures early. And percutaneous treatment is effective if done properly. So that's it. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Jan. Uh, if you stop sharing, then uh, I'll, I'll go on. Yeah, thanks, man. Appreciate it. That was very good. Um, I, know, I know you might be squeezed for time, but there, there are some questions that have come up. If yeah. It's okay. Um, do we have time? Yeah, go ahead. Real quick, um, a couple of things. Uh, uh, Dr. Hannell brought up a good point about anyone augmenting fixation with uh, additional bone graft in those acute proximal pole fractures. Yeah, if I mean, you get them, yeah, if you get them acute, uh, I just stably fix them. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, there was a question from one of the attendees about um, your post-op protocol, John. Um, do you splint cast when you order a CT scan? When do you return to sport? Of course, it depends on the fracture pattern and how comfortable you are with the fixation and how solid it is and how it's healing. Yeah. Well, I think it depends, yeah, on the injury. So if it's a an acute fracture and you get, you know, really rigid stability and I really trust the patient, I'd probably, you know, at two weeks, give them a, rem a removable thumb spica something, you know, a, a ortho, orthoplast splint and let them move a little bit and bathe. Uh, if I'm not, if I'm not comfortable, I'd cast them for about six weeks. Uh, if it's, you know, and, and then again, it depends on the fracture, but it's more proximal pull. Uh, I would back off a little bit for the transcapoid perilunates. It's the, the ligament is healing that takes longer. So, uh, you know, I, I hold them for 10 weeks just, Thanks. just for the ligaments. Thanks, John. Great job, man. Hey, Marco, can I make uh, one comment? And, By and all means, comment? yeah. Go um, ahead. John, those were, those were some awesome cases. Um, and most of the uh, screws that have been demonstrated today are not traditional lag screws. Uh, they are fully threaded screws with a differential pitch. Um, and they don't necessarily, quote, compress. Think of them as a gear, and they translate the bones toward one another. Um, and if, if there's a gap, the gap may not be compressed to apposition by the screw itself. So it's very important to get apposition if you can. And always, always, always put the screw from the smaller piece into the bigger piece. They work much better that way. Awesome, Chuck. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. That, All right. Uh, I was just yeah. saying that I agree with Chuck. And they and in some of the newer screws, yeah, they, they don't compress a lot. So you get it together and it gives it a little nudge, you know, as you put it down. Yeah, they're, uh, they're actually, think of it like a gear. And so once this, when the screw cuts a path, it creates, it, it, it's like a gear. And the gear, depending on the pitch, will translate the bones together. But it may not actually bring them all, all the way together. It's not like a traditional uh, interfragmentary screw, for example. It's not going to work like that kind of, in that pattern, in that fashion. Thanks. OK. Thanks. Uh, so if the faculty can uh, come on and we'll uh, do some cases, um, you know, everyone's welcome to join in. So this case is a 20 year old patient. She's an NCAA soccer player. She was kicked in her right wrist three weeks prior to being seen in the office. Uh, they will show the initial x-rays and the patient did not want to have surgery. So uh, anyone want to take this up, uh, Nick? So you got a fracture here, not very yeah. displaced. She so doesn't want that surgery. She wants to yeah, play. So you can identify the uh, fracture in the x-ray. Uh, I would get a CT for this. I think it would give us some a little bit more information uh, and help her make a shared decision-making process. In terms of returning to play, I think some sports are different than others. Some tolerated yeah. cast, soccer, football uh, are different than basketball, baseball. Admit, so she, yeah. Can you go back? Yeah. Admit, that fracture, it makes me worry, right? That's not an acute crack, right? That's a little, you know, cystic something that's been going on for a while, right? So we look at that, it's not displaced much, but that's not, you know, complete, uh, it, it's not acute crack, something's going on. That makes me worry. So I would jump all it's, over that. And like it's a that. three week, three week gold injury. So yeah, then she comes back. I don't believe she her. She has a cast. Yeah, she has a cast and comes in after another uh, three weeks. Told you, yeah. <laughs> I think this is what's uh, difficult about treating scaphoid fractures non-operatively as a surgeon is you get this x-ray and, um, you know, you get that pit in your stomach uh, a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, so now she's six weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'd probably get a CT scan here if you didn't get one at three weeks. There you go. Uh, 
So now you're getting what is what uh, Perkins would say cystic dieback. So you're getting a cyst there, a um, little displaced. Uh, so what are you going to tell her? Uh, I'm concerned now. I probably, mm -hmm. I don't feel comfortable letting her play uh, with mm -hmm. this in a cast. I just don't think that I'll be able to keep it like that. I think at this point I would uh, prefer operating on this. Um, and now, you know, you might, this might be that time where you're going to get some bone graft in there too. So this is a continuation of the uh, CT. See the gap there, displacement. Uh, so there you go. So um, I, I, I went dorsally and uh, put a um, little bone graft uh, from the distal radius and uh, packed it through a, a needle and uh, fixed that. And this goes on to heal. She's, she's playing. I mean, she has a uh, orthoplast splint and uh, she went on to play and at uh, full uh, range of motion afterwards. So if you do so, do a screw fixation and you put her in a cast, when do you when would you let her go play soccer? Oh, uh, she went to play soccer within the next ten days. Yeah, she was uh, she was practicing first week. Yeah, um, so she had a orthoplast splint and uh, you know taping etc. So she was she was playing right away. But uh, okay. This patient, uh, 50 year old male, um, October had an MVA, wrist pain, was seen in the one of the immediate care centers. Two days later, x-rays uh, were shown to be, have no fractures, splinted and seen hand office. November 17, now it's a month. So now he doesn't want to have surgery. So this is the original one, John. So here he comes back at a month. So he's got a five millimeter gap. John, what will you do? Get him to? Which, uh, which John? Me, John, or? Yeah, yeah you go ahead, go ahead, yeah. Well, you know, so this is displaced. Uh, you know, this, this is uh, kind of par for the course. I don't, I don't feel like we get a lot of scaphoids when we're supposed to get them uh, in my practice practices. So, uh, I, you know, I, I think that this is a surgical case. Uh, there is displacement. Um, and uh, this is uh, going to look worse at surgery, um, uh, but I, you know, I don't think that the month is what's scary to me, uh, because you know this this is kind of when a lot of these walk in in my practice. Okay. Um, so here's the CT. Yeah. Um, so here you're seeing sort of the effects of a uh, of a scaphoid that this is. This is one of these scaphoids that's fin to not heal. So this isn't gonna, yeah. this is not gonna do well left alone. I think that that's what I tell my residents. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I think that this is sort of my gut feelings when I see a scaphoid like this is this is a scaphoid that I can do a lot of good for. Cause there is a fair amount, even though that, um, uh, that sagittal view makes it seem like that piece of bone is small. You know, the coronal view, it's a, it's a nice big juicy piece of bone proximally. Um, yeah. And so I, you, you can do a lot of good here. So here's a, so there's a big screw um, and uh, fixed and he, he went down to heal. Now this so, 20 year so old has a- On the duck handle here, yeah. did you graph that? No, did not. Just, just put a screw across it. So when do you graph those? How big, oh, does, the is, cyst, how big does the cyst have to get before you will graph that? I don't worry about the cyst so much. If uh, you know, if there is um, if there is combination, I would graft it. If there is a, obviously a bo uh, you know, if there is a volar displacement, like in the next case I'll show you, then I'll obviously graft it from the volar side. But the dorsal grafts or um, grafting through the um, uh, screw hole, I do very rarely. I just uh, stably fix them. Okay. I don't worry about the cyst much. I mean, so this I, guy, yeah. To coin, to coin an answer that, I, you know, I've heard from this sort of Cincinnati crew is, you know, it's got to be big enough so that one or both of those sides, those cortices are not dependable. So that that screw is a, not a tripod in the middle of that scaphoid, but it's just sort of uniting 
uh, two ends of a bone and there's no real good cortical uh, uh, cortical um, uh, uh, pillar for it to lean on. I mean, that there are people who would say that. Uh, but I know you asked that question about grafting acute scaphoids. It's pretty rare for me uh, to graft an acute scaphoid. Uh, the cyst has to be big enough so that the screws swim in it, um, uh, is sort of my sort of thought on that. This, I mean, this okay. one didn't, didn't look acute, right? And I think, you know, Doug, that's a great point. When I, if I look at it and there's a hole there, like the case I showed, I put graft in it. And if it's a cystic change and the cartilage is intact, I would still stick some graft through the hole. Um, and you can take little, if it's a cystic non-union, you can take little curettes and scrape it out. But if, the, if there's a little crack in there, I'd stick a little cancellous graft. Or you know, it's not an acute fracture. Okay. So this next case is a 20 year old. Um, injured the right wrist three months prior rock climbing, complaints of pain and limitation of movement of the right wrist. So let's give it to John Capo. John, you, you showed a case like this. So this guy, um, young, guy young guy, 20 year old, rock climbing injury, three months. Yeah, so, um, so, something's wrong, right? So we yeah. need some more views. That looks way, it looks flat. Yeah, oh, that's, that's a problem. Yeah, so you need a CT. I mean, it, it's, the good thing is it's a good proximal pole, but the distal pole looks comminuted. Um, there you go. Yeah. And so it's fallen off it's pretty bad, huh? Yeah, it's been going on for a while, right? You see the cystic mm -hmm. changes, the, the proximal pole volar edge is grinding into that distal scaphoid, kind of like the one I showed. So I think you need to, you know, as a young guy, I think you need to go volar and stand it up and put some graft yeah. in there. And, in you know, I'm not... I'd I don't want to go down the path of vascularized graft, but I would probably, if it's a, di a decent distal pole, I'd do a non-vascularized graft because I want to get would you the do a, Would you do a cortical cancellus or uh, cancellus grafting? Yeah, I, I would do, I, I do a, cort a cortical cancellus and I thin out the cortex, but I think he needs a, a strut in there to hold it up. And, you know, okay. I'd probably have a, a plate around for this one, but you could probably pin it or, or get some small screws in it or a big screw. So, so we did a, a uh, cortical cancellus graft and corrected his DZ deformity and then he went on to heal. Yeah, and it's important to look at, I mean, you see how, how much Amit corrected mm -hmm. that. You know, look at the other side like Diego taught us, get x-rays and you'll be shocked at how short the scaphoid is. I mean, this one is, you can tell it's short, but if you compare it to the other side, it's amazing how short it indeed is. I, I had to put a big graft, graft in there so, because yeah. it was really collapsed. The, uh, so the great let's, thing about let's, putting a cortical cancellus graft in is it's like a sawbones. Once you yeah. get it fashioned right, it's pretty stable and you just stick it in. I wish Jesse were still here because he's done some cancellus only grafting for things like that. So one thing I wanted to uh, mention was this little technique that uh, I, I learned about uh, using a, um, uh, you know, angiocath, a 14 gauge angiocath. And for this fracture, for example, this displaced fracture, I marked the uh, volar side uh, and I use the angiocat to lever the trapezium out of the way and also use it as a soft tissue um, spreader. So I, the, the, and the, also the guide wire, when I put it in, it won't bend because it goes through the 14 gauge angiocat. And I, I can get a center position and I can put my guide wire in. And even if I move the wrist, especially if you're using it from the dorsal side, the guide wire is not going to bend, and uh, this is this has really helped me a lot. This 14 gauge angiocat, and then you can get a center center screw in there uh, quite nicely. So that's one one technique I wanted to show. Anyway, let's uh, skip this and basically, so this is that story of this patient we carry on. 16 year old patient fell on the outstretched hand, and we saw the X-rays of that, uh, and we did a CT, and he's got a collapsed scaphoid. Um, and so this, this kid is uh, going to join the military. So he didn't want any screw put in there. And so I uh, opened it volarly, uh, put in a cortical cancellus graft. Uh, you can see the joysticks in the uh, proximal pole and distal pole there, opened the scaphoid out, reconstructed the geometry of the scaphoid. And I put three K wires in there because the graft was so stable. Um, then I later took these uh, K wires out and he got an excellent result and uh, he, he went into the military. So the take home messages are that uh, 
you have the diagnosis, which is Duckworth criteria, snub box tenderness on all the deviation of three days, scaphoid tubercle tenderness at two weeks, a male, high, in, high in, uh, prevalence of fracture, sports injury, radiological MR, CT scan. Traditionally, the uh, traditional treatment has been immobilized for 10 to 14 days, then x-rays at 10 to 14 days. I think you can do better than that. The x-ray views are PA view, PA with ulnar deviation that builds up the scaphoid, lateral view, and semi-pronated oblique view. For MR, sensitivity is 98%, specificity is 99%, positive predictive values 0.88, and negative predictive values 1.0. So if MR says no fractures, you're 100% reliable that there's no fracture. MR says a fracture, 88% that is a true fracture. So there are 22 publications which were looked at for this study. Uh, and you can see the T1 and T2 weighted, and you can see the bone edema in the MR very early on. CT scan, 94% sensitivity, 96% specificity, and 98% accuracy with positive predictive value 0.75 and negative predictive value 0.99. Bone scan early on, very sensitive, but not very specific. Ultrasound, very sensitive. Uh, fairly sensitive, but uh, you have to have uh, people who do it all the time. I, I can't see anything on the ultrasound. What's coming down the pike is uh, dual energy CT scans, and you can see the MR here. Conventional CT, the, X, the uh, fracture is not seen. MR, you see the bone edema, and dual energy CT shows that clearly. And again here, MR T1, MR STIR. Conventional, you cannot see the uh, conventional CT, you cannot see the fracture but in dual energy CT scan, you can uh, clearly see the fracture. So the poor prognostic indicators are displaced fracture, comminuted fracture, unstable fractures, fractures associated with couple instabilities and proximal pole fractures. Now the soft indications are multiple injuries, fractures of the distal radius in the same side. We looked at the SWIFT studies and we found that there was no difference in surgery uh, or uh, cast treatment for non-displaced fractures. I need to operate on 73 scaphoids to avoid one non-union. Uh, so we looked at all these things and uh, six week CT um, we had to avoid humpback, translation, combination. And then we looked at the different ways of fixing this scaphoid, dorsal percutaneous, volar percutaneous, mini open dorsal, traditional volar approach, plating and complex scaphoid fractures. So thank you very much. If there are any questions, we'll be happy to take that. Thank you.